1950, Lieutenant Tom Hudner is a naval aviator who has transferred to Rhode Island. He walks into the changing room and hears a stern commotion emanating from the toilets. Ensign Jesse Brown emerges and inquires whether he is the new transfer. Hudner meets the other members of Fighter Squadron 32, including Carol Mooring, Bo Lavery, Marty Good, and Bill Koenig. They are led by Lieutenant Commander Dick Sevoli, who shows them intelligence indicating that Stalin and the Soviets have tested their own atomic bomb, and it is only a matter of time before they attach it to a bomber. Sevoli assigns Hudner to work with Brown. In the air, Brown flies without considering the risks, but he always remains in control, even if he doesn't always follow the rules. On the way back, they deviate from their intended path. Hudner follows him, as a wingman never leaves his partner. The flying is not what Hudner is accustomed to. Brown even executes a nosedive in a residential area, and if you observe closely, a kind lady named Daisy Brown stands in her front yard and waves at them as they pull out of the dive at the last moment. After returning to the locker room, Hudner asks Brown about their aerial maneuver. Brown responds, the best way to get to know your wingman is at 2,000 feet. Hudner then proposes that they go for a beer to get to know each other better, but Brown declines, stating that he does not consume alcohol. Severly invites the squadron over to his house for clams. While there, Hudner shares with Lavery that he joined the Navy immediately after hearing about the attack on Pearl Harbor, but graduated only a month after the war ended. Lavery reflects that life does not always turn out as one plans, asking, did you ever imagine you'd be in a squadron with a colored aviator? Hudner sidesteps the question and proceeds to the food. Brown drives home and waves to a neighbor who appears displeased to see him. Upon entering his home, he sneaks in and startles his wife, Daisy, who is painting the walls of the hallway. Despite this, they have a cheerful and affectionate marriage, and are the parents of a three-year-old daughter named Pam. Severly provides the team with a briefing. A reconnaissance aircraft was discovered washed ashore with bullet holes beneath it. As a result, the team must now prepare themselves to be ready for the Russians in a new type of aircraft, known as the Widowmaker. The engine on this plane is one of the most powerful things these pilots will ever fly behind. If the throttle is overused, it will cause the plane to spin uncontrollably. The engine has enough torque to flip a house, hence the pilots must exercise caution and handle it with care. On his way home, Hudner notices that Brown has pulled over on the side of the road with car trouble. Hudner kindly offers him a ride home. During the ride, Hudner shares that he was summoned to embark on an adventure and did not want to inherit his father's grocery stores. On the other hand, Brown always wanted to fly with the best pilots, so he joined the Navy. When they arrive at Brown's house, Daisy cordially invites Hudner to have a drink, but Brown insists that Hudner has plans to attend to. Understanding his intention, Hudner politely declines the offer. Daisy reminds Brown to be courteous, but Brown is unaware of Hudner's background yet. The pilots personally inspect the Widowmakers and practice flying them through various drills to get accustomed to the new aircraft. After their training, they receive news that they are being deployed. Before leaving home, Daisy encourages Brown and boosts his confidence. The following day, Brown retreats to the bathroom stall and waits until all the other members of the locker room have left. He then stares at himself in the mirror and makes several derogatory comments to himself. Hudner is in his plane, and the entire team is watching as he prepares to land. He manages to do so without any issues. Next, it is Brown's turn. All the black crew members on the carrier come up to witness the event. However, Brown is flying too high, and Hudner tells him to get his nose up. The flagman guides him up, and Brown misses the carrier. He tries again and manages to land the plane despite the pressure. All the pilots pass their carrier qualifications, and Hudner does so with perfect scores. They are due to set sail tomorrow, and Severly instructs the team to sort out the personal matters. Hudner gives Brown a lift home, and Brown cordially invites him inside. Daisy offers Hudner a drink and earnestly requests him to be there for Brown. Brown enjoys his evening with his family at the seaside. The following day, the team dashes along the corridors, up the stairs and to their planes on the carrier. But it's only a drill and Severly reprimands them, saying they need to perform better. 
The team heads back to their quarters, but Brown is asked to speak with Life magazine for a positive story to alleviate the public's concerns about another possible war. Brown desires to be treated the same as any other pilot, but the interviewer wishes to highlight his race. Severly intervenes and retrieves Brown, reminding him to concentrate on his duties. Below deck, one of the army men asks if Brown can juggle as well. Hudner confronts the man, but Brown intervenes and tells the pilots to walk away. Hudner wanted to teach the man a lesson, but Brown believes it's better to avoid conflict. Severly requires a volunteer for a task that no one desires to undertake. Hudner volunteers, but Brown nudges Mooring to do it, and Hudner accepts it. Mooring carries out the task in the plane but is unable to make the landing, and the plane crashes into the sea. Mooring's death troubles everyone, but Brown tells Hudner that he doesn't appreciate his remarks about what Mooring should have or could have done. Hudner insists that the pilots won't die if they do what they're instructed. Later, the pilots raise a toast to Mooring. When it's only Brown and Hudner, Brown tells Hudner at the academy, they made him repeat his tests ten times since they didn't believe a black man could swim. They put rocks in his flight suit, held him under and put ice in the water. They didn't care if he died in that pool, but every time Brown made it out. He would have been dead if he had done what people told him to do. The pilots go ashore and go sightseeing. Brown stops by a store to buy a gift for Daisy and notices a crowd of sailors nearby. He approaches the crowd and discovers that the commotion is due to actress Elizabeth Taylor's presence. One of the sailors makes a derogatory comment about Brown not being able to be with her. Elizabeth Taylor invites Brown to a casino party later that night. The pilots arrive at the party, but the French casino denies them entry. However, Brown manages to impress them by speaking fluent French, and they reluctantly allow them in. After dancing and having a few drinks, they express their gratitude to Elizabeth and move on to another location. Hudner notices an attractive woman and impresses her with a magic trick. However, things take a turn when the army men from the carrier arrive, and a brawl breaks out because one of them believed that he had a chance with Elizabeth at the casino, but Brown ruined his opportunity. Severly gives the team a briefing about the situation. The North Koreans have captured Seoul. If they continue to advance and capture the rest of the southern peninsula, they could potentially invade Japan. This could pose a significant threat to America's ability to contain the spread of communism. The ship embarks for Korea with the knowledge that there could be as many as 100,000 Chinese troops already present in North Korea. The mission at hand is to eliminate two bridges located over a major river along the border in an attempt to impede the Chinese from sending in additional troops. On this occasion, Severly joins the team in flight. However, Hudner confirms that Severly's plane has a mechanical problem with the landing gear and hands over command to Hudner. As they fly over, they encounter enemy fire. Despite being unable to completely destroy the bridges, Brown disobeys orders and returns to complete the mission. In Korea, the soldiers are now stationed on the ground, enduring freezing temperatures while waiting for the Chinese to strike. When they finally do, it's a lopsided battle. Hudner submits his mission report to Sevoli, detailing what happened during the operation. Brown approaches him and argues that the rules of discipline apply differently to him than to others. Hudner empathizes and asks his team to submit their own accounts to support Brown's actions. Hudner informs him that the team has submitted their statements, but Brown believes it won't make a difference. When Hudner asks what he can do, Brown simply requests his support as a wingman. Forget the rules, he says, just jump in the water with me. On deck, Brown steps out to get some fresh air. He is soon joined by a black crew member, who informs Brown that the entire crew heard about his impressive flying the other day and wanted to congratulate him. They all chipped in and bought him a watch in Khan, which has been engraved with the words, above all others. Brown is deeply moved by this unexpected act of kindness. On the runway, Brown bumps into an old friend whom he affectionately calls Alabama. It turns out that Alabama is now part of the search and rescue unit. Daisy receives a letter from Brown, who has hidden her birthday gift and given her clues to find it. She follows the clues and discovers the gift, a pair of earrings, in Pam's closet. Brown signs off the letter with, lovingly and completely yours. I'll love you forever. Severly and the team are given a grim briefing. 
The army is entrenched in a brutal battle, with six Chinese soldiers hiding in the woods for every marine. The temperature drops below minus 30 degrees at night, and the soldiers are barely hanging on. Air support could make a huge difference, but it is an incredibly dangerous mission. On the battlefield, the marines make progress and advance to a better position with the help of the pilots. But as they depart, Hudner notices that Brown's plane is leaking fuel. Brown insists it's oil, but he knows he needs to bring the plane down gently before it's too late. With a hard landing, Brown's plane crashes, and Hudner fears the worst when he sees no movement. Without hesitation, Hudner makes the brave decision to crash land his own plane to be by Brown's side, despite the other pilots' attempts to stop him. Hudner rushes over to Brown, who is pinned between his seat and the control panel. Despite their efforts, the two men are unable to lift the heavy panel off of him. However, Alabama overhears the call and informs them that he's on his way to help. In the bitter cold, Hudner places his beanie cap on Brown's head to keep him warm. He attempts to put out the fire on Brown's engine with snow, but Brown remains trapped between his seat and the control panel. Alabama arrives and joins in the rescue effort, but they are unable to free Brown. Brown's condition deteriorates rapidly, and he asks Hudner to convey his eternal love to Daisy. In desperation, Hudner begins hitting the plane with all his strength to try to free Brown, but he eventually realizes that Brown has passed away. After realizing that Brown had passed away, Hudner is devastated. He promises to come back for his friend and comrade. However, when he begs his commanders to let him go back for Brown's body, they deny him. The pain of not being able to retrieve Brown's body haunts him for the rest of his life. He never forgets the sacrifice that his friend made for him and their country. Daisy is overcome with emotion when she receives a letter from the War Department. As time passes, she flies to Washington where President Truman presents the Medal of Honor to Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner. After the ceremony, Hudner speaks with Daisy about his fears leading up to the event. Daisy expresses her gratitude for what Hudner did. He reveals that Brown's last words were for her, just tell Daisy I love her. Hudner apologizes for not being able to save Brown, but Daisy reassures him that it was not his job. She only wanted him to be there for Brown, and he was. The families of Hudner and Brown remained friends for the rest of their lives, and the descendants continued to maintain a close relationship. The film concludes with Brown's voice reading his final letters to Daisy, signed off with his trademark phrase, your devoted husband, lovingly and completely yours. Jesse. If you enjoyed this video, we kindly ask you to show your support by leaving a like and subscribing to our channel. Your support means a lot to us and will help us create more quality content in the future. Thank you for watching.